what is something that you think you know a lot about, but there's definitely a lot more to it than what you know? I feel like I think I know a lot about Lord of the Rings, and then I oh. remember how many books there are. <laughs> <laughs> how many books are there? So many, Kyle. There's a million. Are there really? <laughs> well, because there's the Lord of the Rings books, and then there's yeah. The Hobbit, and then there's The Silmarillion, and then there's oh, a million other things. I forgot about I've that I've got one so many those. books in my drawers that I'm probably never going to read because they're just tomes of history. I mean, that's... But, but, but I like to think I know a lot about Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I feel like most people are in that boat, Emily. <laughs> what about you guys? Yeah. Arna, you got anything? Yeah, I'm a uh, biologist. So I think I know a lot about biology, but uh, the reality is I think nobody really knows a whole lot about it. We're, <laughs> sure. we're all just, that, that's part of the, the intrigue with the field is that we're always learning more and more and more. Oh, so that's go. part of why I love it. Inherently a mysterious field. Yeah. Absolutely. Like the bottom of the ocean. We don't know nothing about there. <laughs> but the problem is one day we're going to find out that everything we know about the bottom of the ocean is everything to know. And then we're going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a letdown. <laughs> nothing down here. Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Emily Moyers and Kyle Imperator take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our podcast, Butter No Parsnips. I'm Emily Boyers. And I'm Kyle Imperator. Speaking of things I know a lot about, but don't actually. Uh, Emily, have you got something for me, right? Uh, have I got something for you, Kyle? I've got a word. Oh, yeah, a word. All right. I mean, okay. I, it was either going to be that or a birthday present, but, you know, a, a word works. It's like, you know, what we do here, yeah. I guess, is fine. Well, at least half the time. But, yeah, Kyle, today I do have a word for you. Uh, maybe I'll have a birthday present another day. But oh. this is this Ooh. is one of my little tricky words, Kyle. This one might trip you up. A tricky word. I'm all for it. Kyle, your word this week is digestion. D i g e s t. T I O N, digestion. Uh, I, I, yeah. I mean, Kyle, I, if you know it, you know it. Don't overthink it. I mean, like digestion, like the the thing that happens when you like eat food and uh -huh. it goes through you and you poop it out like that. Digestion. I mean, <laughs> that's what big stomach wants you to think. Emily, I cannot tell if Big Stomach is an industry term or it's just a guy who eats a lot and has steaks in my knowing what <laughs> digestion is. <laughs> uh, well, Kyle, you're pretty much on the ball with the definition, but I can't give you a winning theme just yet. And you'll see why. The main reason being that I have someone here who's going to break it all down for us. No pun intended. A guest episode? Yes. That's right. <laughs> and I brought the guest today, not you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so but still please. to help me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so please welcome Arna Christensen to the podcast. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, Arna, we are so happy to have you. So uh, happy. Why don't you start by telling the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. I teach at a state college in uh, Massachusetts, and I teach uh, different types of courses in biology and anatomy and physiology, and uh, recently have started getting into etymology and the origin of words as they relate to medical terms. And I've been going down that rabbit hole for oh, about a year, which I should actually preface <laughs> that although I'm a biologist and have an interest in medical terminology, I'm new to the etymology bit, and I'm a, an excited newcomer. And a worthwhile newcomer. You've got so much to offer us. <laughs> Specifically, your specialization is so great for our show because Emily and I seem to run into so many different medical terms that we'd love to bring up and talk about. But if we covered everyone, we'd just turn into a <laughs> medical podcast, which, you know, you can call us clinical all you want, but nothing about us is medical. So <laughs> let's start with... How did you find yourself in the world of etymology? It started a few years ago where a colleague and I, uh, this was Joan Beth Gao, somebody I was working with, uh, decided that we were going to write a medical terminology textbook. 
And the idea of the textbook that was going to set it apart a little bit from the ones that are out there right now is that it would be really based in case studies. And case studies are kind of like vignettes or little stories that generally start out with a patient that has signs and symptoms. And then that together with a lot of potentially complicated medical terms gets the students to kind of engage with the terms rather than just looking at terms and their definitions. So it's a little more dynamic experience in the classroom. So we wrote this book and then the publisher asked us to create some supplemental materials that could go online that instructors could use to work with the text. And one of those was presentations of the cases. And we front loaded those cases with a select term and kind of dug into what the origin of that term was, its etymology, and found a lot of them are, are actually not all that interesting. <laughs> they, uh, you could almost imagine two, three, four hundred years ago, a bunch of people sitting around in a room trying to figure out what to call something in a standardized way. And they just came to a consensus saying, I don't know, what, what do they call it in Latin or Greek or something like that? Or, yeah. And that's what it is now. And th those are kind of the dead ends. And there might be a really interesting story there. It's just not really available. So if you go to some different resources like Etymology Online, I'm sure you're familiar with, but I'm, Very. I'm on that website five times a day. Yeah. It's, it's a really nice website. <laughs> it's great. It, it'll tell you the origin of a term. And sometimes that that's kind of the end of the story. But sometimes they're really interesting. And there's really rich histories behind a lot of these words. And sometimes the histories are 2000 years old. And these yeah. words have been traveling the world and evolving and changing. And that's really where my interest kind of was sparked with etymology, trying to understand the history of some of these words, yeah. and how they relate to humanity. Because I think it, it's a part of all at least with Western medicine, it's a part of our kind of shared experience. So that, that's where my interest came in to etymology. You know, it's really fascinating how when you start to learn all of these roots, how much they can apply to everything that you do in your life. And just kind of knowing uh, the meaning of certain parts of these words that we work with every day kind of helps you learn the rest of language <laughs> and how we interact with each other. Yeah, and that's exactly right. So that that's a big piece of initially why it was a part of the text, but then even going on, you know, I'm still an instructor, still a teacher, and that's part of what I'm drawn to. So that was the motivation with the Instagram account where I kind of follow up on some of these terms because I'm motivated to provide some different ways to think about words. Because I think when you can come towards terms or concepts from different angles, it's going to help the learning experience, right? So you'll you'll get it in one kind of paradigm, and then you step in with these other alternative views, and that can only help with learning and making a richer story. Yeah, and I think what you're doing with you know bringing it to social media is kind of it's such a natural extension of everything, where that's kind of where people can use this kind of you know basic information to build on their everyday knowledge. It's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of like the center for like informal learning. It's where people can totally. get just little bite sized pieces of information that they might not like be tapped into when they're in like a, a classroom and they're kind of tuning out. But if they're just getting it in bits, exactly. you can like get through to a, a, another group. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And some of it's kind of superficial, the term and the origin will be interesting, but it's not a real deep, complicated concept. And that's okay, too, because it's fun and interesting. But then sometimes un alternate terms will be involved in much more complicated processes, and it'll help to kind of remember their place you know, in the way that they're affecting things or being affected. But those fun and interesting etymologies are really what uh, what we love to dig into here on the podcast. <laughs> if I remember right, off the air, you told us the etymology of migraine that was super interesting. Can you remind us of that? Because I loved that. Can I back up a little bit and, and tell you For about sure. so, some different types of words? Because that'll fall into some different types of words and etymologies. Because I, th I think of them as having kind of different flavors. Sure. Getting more interesting. And the least interesting example would be like nares. Uh, because that is Latin for nostrils. But if you didn't know sure. that, you'd be like, nares, well, what's the origin of that term? It could be something super fascinating. You know, it could be where asteroids struck the earth and left some sort of, <laughs> a, you don't know, you know, what the story behind yeah. it is. But you look it up and you're like, this is one of those cases where it's a few hundred years old and it's Latin for nostrils. So yeah. okay, that's kind of the end of the story. Right. But then another term that is a little more interesting uh, would be something like the filtrum. And that's that divot right above yeah. your upper lip in between yeah. your nose and your upper, upper lip. And that's Greek for love potion. But it came about the same time. You know, it's a few hundred years old, so it's not an ancient term. 
But it's still interesting because you can think about these folks in a room three, four hundred years ago trying to think of a name for this. And they're like, well, let's call it like love potion for Greek. It's, like, yeah. it's not just yeah. the Greek word what, for that thing. So, what could have been the logic for yeah. calling it a love potion? That's crazy. <laughs> they had to be in the sauna at the time. Just <laughs> chatting it up. <laughs> hey, do you know what that space above your lip is called? <laughs> That's my favorite part. <laughs> and then kind of the third tier would be the tragus. So the tragus is that fleshy flap of skin right in front of the what we call the external acoustic meatus, that hole in the ear. So it's that little okay. flap of skin is called the tragus. And tragus is an ancient term, and it means he goat <laughs> or, or, oh. or billy goat. And that's because in some people, it starts to grow kind of its own little goatee. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> it's a little billy goat beard. Right, yeah. on either side of your head. I, I got to trim that every now and then. <laughs> so that, that's the tragus. And now, like, this is getting richer because now I'm thinking about 2,000 years of history, probably like we're laughing about it. 500 years ago in France, they were laughing about it. it it's this whole, like, story kind of word that it's stuck around and persisted and evolved. So, so those kind of words I really like. So now you have an ancient term with a, with a quirky meaning. And then with, with migraine was really cool because it, it means um, it also goes back to ancient Greek but here the hemicrania is what the Greek word was and I'm going to mispronounce all of these Greek terms so I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> to all I'm, our Greek yeah, listeners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we've been mispronouncing everything that we do so it's okay. <laughs> but it means uh, half skull, hemicrania and the rationale there is that with migraines usually the pain originates in half of the head so it's, it's not right. an entire headache it's a headache disproportionately localized to one side of the head. And then it's associated with nausea. And this was in the original description that's thousands of years old. A sensitivity to light and sound. You know, so you have all these signs and symptoms that are pretty convincing that they're not just talking about a headache here. They're actually talking about a migraine, right? A very specific right. type of disorder. And then that word moved into Latin and then the colloquial, the vernacular, I'm sorry, but um, there's a name for that, the type of Latin. Um, the dialect? It, yeah. But it's the, the C or the K turned to a G, so it became hemigrania, and then went oh. to Middle French, where they didn't know what to do with that leading H, so it just turned into migrania, and then that eventually became migraine. So now we have, and this is another example of this word, you know, has persisted for thousands of years, gone through eras, you know, yeah. with people appreciating that this isn't just a headache, this is a very specific type of thing. And, and nowadays we use it. So, so what I like about that is that that's also a really accessible word. Everybody knows what a migraine is. There's a little right. bit of an educational piece so that students learning about medicine can recognize that it has this half a head type of origin that's oftentimes you know, kind of initiates the pain. So now there's a little more of an educational robustness to it. And then I also really like the idea of something like that type of discomfort from thousands of years ago is, is a connection to history that isn't like if you see a fresca or a statue. Those are great, and they're representations from thousands of years ago, but they're, they're distinct, whereas you're connected to a feeling with a migraine. You can almost yeah. you know, empathize with the actual thing that they were feeling. So it's another way to kind of think about history. To, to It's almost like experiencing history. Right, to dis oh, wow. disconnected by time, which I, I also think is really neat. Yeah, I mean, that's like a really visceral feeling there. You're thinking yeah. about how somebody in, in ancient past, Rome getting a migraine, <laughs> getting a migraine, yeah. and you can now say, Hey, that's me. <laughs> and talking about it, and they're like, No, it's not the whole head. And, you know, it's just a couple yeah. people in the room. It's up, like to this side of the head. You know, <laughs> I think it's uh, vaporous humors coming from my stomach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I love things like that, too, where like it dropped the H when it went to French. I, I really like like when you look at how words evolved over time, a lot of times how the, they changed is just through use. I think about a lot when I'm like writing and I'm coming up with like fantasy names. I think about like, well, if it originally was this and then it got said for a thousand years, what yeah. syllables might get dropped or slurred? Because that's a thing that happens in language and it's super cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and what made it, as a biologist, I tend to think about evolution and fitness and selection with a word that's got to stick across a broad geography. And how does it outcompete the other variant on that word yeah. is also really interesting. Oh, it's really interesting to think of words in the context of evolution, of of what's the fittest to survive. I've never 
I've never thought of it in that context, but now I'm wondering who the lexicologist <laughs> Charles Darwin is. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with with biology, you have these beautiful taxonomic trees where you can follow lineages as as they evolve and as they speciate and deviate and become their own thing. I'm, I'm sure that I, I'm, I've seen it. So it happens with words too, but that yeah, would be its sure. own interesting you know, science Ooh. to get into. We have to start coming up with taxonomic nomenclatures for words <laughs> now. <laughs> or do, do you get words that, that speciate? That, that I don't know. So here, of course, with evolution, you get one species becomes two for a variety of reasons. Right. Does one word become two and both stick around? Sure. I mean, I, I don't know. well, there's emerald and smaragdin. There is emerald and, <laughs> sm- emerald and smaragd. Smaragd, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so they came from a similar origin and then split. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of thing does happen. Uh, sorry, I'm just remembering that the word for this episode was digestion, right? Yeah. Does that <laughs> play into something here? <laughs> it sure does, buddy, because as you mentioned and as is the whole purpose of this podcast, etymology is a great way to learn about things that aren't just the words themselves. And so Arna, if I'm not mistaken, you have quite the adventure lined up for Kyle and I in order to get us to that winning theme that we're both waiting on. Sure, yeah. And I hope it's okay if I just start out Briefly saying digestion, the origin of that term, yeah, um, is from disgenere. The origin there is Latin, but it's a part for dis and then genere for carry away. So it's to carry away, to, kind of to carry apart. Um, and I mention that because that's what we're talking about with digestion and it's taking materials and really tearing them apart and breaking them down into small enough pieces that the body knows what to do with them, that, that it can absorb them. Right. So that's what we're about to kick into here. Oh, love it. All right. So this is a choose your own adventure. <gasps> okay. <laughs> and before we get going here on, on the digestive system journey, uh, we're going to make our way through the gastrointestinal tract. Oh, and so I feel this- like I'm in the magic school bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So to start out, if you were a food, what food would you be? Oh, are we each different <sighs> foods or do we have to be the same food? Wide open and I can I can throw some suggestions if you want. <laughs> I mean, Kyle, it feels like you have to be ice cream. <laughs> oh, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Done. Is that Kyle an is at all times of day thinking about <laughs> the next time he can eat ice cream. <laughs> I'll go simple. I'll be like an apple. All right. They actually pair really well. So that's perfect. Sure. Okay. So that's the situation. We're starting this journey um, and it's going to begin here in a dank, unstable cavern. Oh, unstable. Ooh. Fluids rain down upon you and the cavern begins to fill. 32 stalagmites and stalactites mobilize and begin to grind to disrupt your being. You are ushered towards the rear of the dark cavern where you encounter a fleshy guardian. The fleshy guardian speaks. I block the cavity of the nose and direct you down the chute. My ancient name is the Latin diminutive for a viney fruit. I'm sorry, I just have to quickly tell the audience who's listening that Kyle and I are flipping out so much right now. We are elated. So, I didn't know this was going to be Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, <laughs> Kyle and I are freaking out. So, do we have to guess the name of this fleshy guardian or destroy him? You, you have to guess the name of the fleshy guardian. That's the riddle. In order it's to the- go... It's the this one, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you like a hint? Sure. Yeah. Throw it at us. I definitely, it's somewhere in my brain. It's just buried deep. All right. The origin is Latin, but it right now currently is the word for grape in Spanish. Well, the word I'm thinking of, it would be crazy if that's the word for grape in Spanish, but maybe uh, it too. is. Me too. Me too. But go ahead. I, I want to say, because it's. I think it's related to the singing to like a glottal stop so i want to say it's like epiglottis can i tell you no but hold on to that okay (laughs) (laughs) because that was amazing (laughs) see the word that came to my mind is it the uvula yep oh that's grapes in spanish (laughs) (laughs) uva so um yeah it's from latin uh uvola small bunch of grapes oh wow. wow Which is because it looks like a hanging grape in your mouth. Exactly, yeah. And and what it does is it, it helps to protect 
from having ingested materials go up into the nasal cavity. I don't know if you've ever seen or had the experience of milk coming out of your nose, but that would be a situation where that guardian was not necessarily doing its job the way it should be. Gotcha. I need to pay my guardian better, obviously, (laughs) because he's really slacking. Yeah. (laughs) All right. You are propelled a short way down a chute. When to your side, you see a small channel that draws vast quantities of warm air. You sense this is the wrong avenue, but the air draws you closer. Atop the dubious avenue is a second guardian who speaks. I shield the trachea and protect the lung. My ancient name is Greek for upon the tongue. That's the one that I have. That's the epiglottis, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's great. So um, all of these are ancient terms. So those are the ones I prefer. So this is an ancient term too. But looking at an etymology online, it gives it um, 1610. So that's when it was first kind of formalized, I guess, for the way that we use it now in medical terminology. Um, So it means upon the tongue, uh, epi for on, of course. And then glottis is um, a variant of glossa for tongue. Mm -hmm. And and what I thought was interesting about that is that that also gives us glossary. Yeah. Oh! Yeah, that's an ancient reference to foreign tongues for for words that aren't aren't in use or for bizarre words. At least historically, that's what it was for. That's so fun. So good. Okay, so what I did want to mention before moving forward is that if, if you rub the front of your throat, you can actually feel the trachea or the windpipe. And that's the, the epiglottis is protecting that tube and then, of course, the lungs below that from ingested materials. And what is interesting about that is that trachea is short for the Greek trachea arteria which means the rough windpipe. And why that's interesting is because arteria is windpipe, which is a disconnect from the way that we use arteries. Because arteries, also an ancient term, or comes from an ancient term, refers to to windpipes. So then that, of course, raises the question, why are we calling arteries windpipes? But of course, that is the question. (laughs) And what, what is so cool about this story is that it goes way back to ancient Greece when people were trying to understand the circulatory system And as we know it now, of course, the circulatory system circulates blood. It's two connected circuits. And if you're a red blood cell, you make your way through one circuit, the lungs, and then the other circuit to the body. So it's two connected circuits. But these two circuits, if you want, you can think about them conceptually like a figure eight. At their farthest reaches, like consider, for instance, like the, the pinky toe, the little toe, That's pretty far from the heart. At that point, you have arteries leading that way and getting smaller and smaller and smaller until they're microscopic. And that's where you get the exchange of gases and nutrients with the tissues. And then they build up bigger and bigger and bigger into veins and go back to the heart. But without the benefit of a microscope or an understanding of things that are microscopic, it basically looks like two distinct systems that come in close proximity but aren't connected Right. Right. So for a long time, going back to ancient Greece, we're talking, you know, leading up until Galen, who's a really prominent ancient Greek physician, the understanding there that they had developed was that the veins are a connected system of vessels and they carry blood. And when you ingest material, it makes its way from the gut into the veins, into the blood, the liver goes to work on it a little bit, and then it kind of pulsates throughout the body just in the venous system. Now, the arteries were different. The other half of the system carried air. By the time Galen came around, he was like, no, it's it's really kind of blood and air. So it had kind of evolved a little bit, but they still thought that there were two distinct systems. And then the arteries make their way to the lungs and pick up air and bring that air in. They called it pneuma. And then that was brought around towards the body. And then it wasn't for 1,400 years or something that we appreciated that it's actually a connected system. And this gets to William Harvey. Emily, I think you brought up William Harvey before. I did. Yeah, he's kind of a big deal. And one of the things that he did was establish that these two systems are truly connected in their circulation. And to take a step back, it's, it's tempting to look back at ancient Greece or antiquity and kind of laugh a little bit about these, what we kind of perceive now as silly misunderstandings. But it was groundbreaking. You know, they, right. they, were, they were taking the initiative to try to understand where there was very little understanding before and, and think of something workable. Yeah, yeah. they just didn't know. <laughs> they just yeah. didn't know that, you know, they had no assumptions that were grounded enough to work with. So in that you know, from that perspective, it's amazing that they came up with this misconception. But yeah. then also that it stuck around for so long. And that this is cool because it's a story that's wrong, 
But the longer it persists, 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, yeah. people are less likely to be like, I don't know about that. Yeah. Because you know, who's going to step in and say that this, what we know to be true is wrong? Yeah. Right? And now, now we know that to be wrong. So then also, you know, 2,000 years from now, what are we going to, like, what yeah. do we know now that in 2,000 years is going to be like totally absurd, which almost gets back to the opening question. Like, what, what do you think you know a lot about? <laughs> yeah, that you everything know? probably. <laughs> right, everything. Like, we're all wrong about everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just like to think about that too. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, they're going to say that blood is just liquid air is what's going to happen. <laughs> totally, Galen's going to be like, I told yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle William Harvey was the guy who did the autopsy on the old, old, very old man. Oh, Tom Parker. Tom Parker. <laughs> Tom right. Parker. Oh. <laughs> That's right. That, that had is, me cracking up. His butyraceous blood. Yeah. His butyraceous blood. All right. right. So uh, you've been successful so far. Actually, yeah. you're doing really well. We've uh, made yeah. it to the esophagus. Yeah. Nice. Yep. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so you continue your journey descending down through the tomb, the esophagus through the neck, thoracic cavity, then through the diaphragm, and you're thrilled with your progress and filled with optimism for what comes next. You're released into an undulating chamber with walls pulsating and constricting into an acrid pool of gastric juices. You have entered the stomach. And if it's okay, I'll introduce a quote here from an Italian anatomist from 1497, Alessandro Benedetti. The stomach is the lowest and has a hidden place in the body because of its uncleanliness, as though nature has spared the principal members and has relegated the stomach or bowels rather far away from the sight of reason and of the mind and fenced it off with the diaphragm in order not to disturb the rational part of the mind with its importunity. These members serve the highest ones. Some of them concoct the food into juice, others digest it into various humors, others expel the superfluity. Uh, so this, at, at the time, leading up until this time, it was thought that the stomach was not only a, really a primary organ of digestion, and that was appreciated, but that it was also a filtering device for understanding, you know, what's separating the wheat from the sha shafe, shaft, shafe? Chaff? Chaff, <laughs> right. One um, of those. <laughs> one of those. Uh, kind, of, kind of filtering through what's ingested to determine what's needed and what's not. And it was also recognized that even at this point, once the materials are absorbed into the bloodstream, it wasn't ready to go yet. There, there's still the liver needed to work on it and continue to modify the materials before our, our body was really ready for it. Right. It's just a pit stop. Totally. Yeah. So your progress beyond the stomach is stymied by your third and final guardian, it stands before you and before a sphincter, which like the sphinx is derived from sphingine to squeeze or bind, which was first used in an anatomical sense by Galen. The pylorus speaks. Oh, you know, I messed it up. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> I am the watcher of the gate that links the stomach to the gut. A gate like that one that links the sphinxes to the temple of mutt. <laughs> Can I guess? <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually okay because this was the one that I was most uncertain. My hint is kind of lousy and I, I wasn't sure we'd get there. So, so yes, guess. I mean, I've never heard it. What, the pylora? The pylorus is the region. Okay. Yeah, I've never pylorus. heard of that. Isn't that isn't that a Dr. Seuss character? <laughs> the pylorus. <laughs> yeah. And then there's there's a circular muscle there, the pyloric sphincter, and that that maintains stuff in the stomach while the gastric juices go to work on the materials for you know for a few hours. Um, so that the hints there were going to be pylon. So a pylon is the name of in a temple. It's a type of architectural structure, apparently, where you get these yeah. kind of two elevated regions, but it, but it's kind of like a gateway. And the, the pylorus actually means, in, in Greek, it literally means the gatekeeper, the gate watcher. Wow. And that, that's also an ancient term. So I thought that was neat that there's there's these actual people that are gate watchers that hang out by the gate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to go back to the the quote that you said before. I It's, it's amazing how they're am anthropomorphizing, like, the digestive system at, at that time because it was just so uh i don't know it it felt so real i was like oh i understand this <laughs> yeah and I, I love the conversations that must have been happening 
you know, in antiquity about these different types of yeah. anatomy. Yeah. Like, what, what do you think about this gatekeeper? Like, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I gatekeeper. Know. Yeah, I know this gatekeeper, and I think he, he's kind of like <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of sphinctery. <laughs> he's kind of sphinctery. <laughs> I know a couple of people like that. <laughs> I also didn't know that sphincter and sphinx came from the same root. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah, I didn't know that until two hours ago. I was like, oh, I wanna... <laughs> I, I'm glad that the sphincter, like there isn't an anthropomorphic sphincter that gives us riddles. Right. Because that would be a really bad <laughs> way to remember Egyptian history. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so congratulations. You are granted passage into the gut, into the intestine, where you will enjoy secretions from the gallbladder and pancreas and progress through the three sections of the small intestine. The combining form for small intestine is entero, as in enteroscopy and dysentery. The first section of the small intestine is the duodenum, derived from the Latin duodenum digitorum, or the space of 12 fingers, because it's the shortest bit of the small intestine and it's the breadth of 12 fingers. So I don't know if you've heard the term duodenum before. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but that's where we get that. That's so cool. And then next is the jejunum. So that's the second part of the small intestine. And that name is derived from Latin jejunus because post-mortem, this part of the small intestine is oftentimes found empty. And I don't know if you've heard oh. the word jejun before, which means empty or kind of vapid. It can be related to personality. That's, oh. that's tied into that part of the intestine. That's a great connection. Yeah. And then the final section of the small intestine is the ileum. And that's derived from the Latin ileus, uh, which means severe colic. Also from ileus Greek, which means colic. And that is a reference probably to ilium, the Greek term ilium, which means to turn, referencing kind of that convoluted, twisting, turning nature of the small intestine. All right. So now you're out of the small intestine. Right. Your journey has nearly come to an end. Most of what's useful in you has been extracted. Only the final absorption of water, salts, and remaining nutrients takes place. And this occurs in the colon until all that remains of you will be expelled. Yeah. <laughs> nice job. I wasn't sure how that would go. <laughs> Especially on the two it. and the three that I didn't give you the answer to. <laughs> no, that was probably the most magical experience I've ever had. Honestly, had truly. yeah, wow. yeah. I, I I've never been so excited to literally get to the bottom of things before oh, in my life. Kyle, you're a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Arna, that was phenomenal it was truly like the magic school bus except different <laughs> in every imaginable way <laughs> thank you so much for taking us on that journey and i think since we all made it to the bottom we can get that winning theme now so you know, <gasps> cue the music bring in the dancing lobsters <laughs> bring in the dancing <laughs> lobsters oh my gosh thank you arna for putting that together for us oh, sure. and maybe we can have you on again in the future to bring us on another adventure through some medical terms yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. We can pick a different system. Nice. The urinary system. That's going to be our next stop. That would okay. work. It's <laughs> a nice story. Relax. It's a nice story. <laughs> no, let's settle down because now we're going to go into our game. No? And this one is not going to be collaborative like last time. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> In this game, we are talking about the fact that medical terms are pretty famous or infamous, I should say, for being very long. They've got so many long words. In fact, they've also got a long word for the fear of long words. And that is also the name of today's game, Hippopotamostra sesquipedaliophobia. Okay. I think I got that. <laughs> is that a real word? It is. I used to be better at saying it, but then I realized I was pronouncing it wrong. So now I have to pronounce it the right way. <laughs> <laughs> so this game is pretty easy in the fact that for Kyle, it's basically going to be a game of chance. But if you've got Perfect. some prior knowledge, you might have a leg up, Arna. Okay. <laughs> the way it's going to work, I'm going to give you the definition of a long medical term. And then I'm going to give you all the parts of the word jumbled up. So, for example, I might say, this is a fear of long words, monstro, hippo, pedaly, potamo, sesqui, a phobia. I'll always give you the ending in the right place. So, in that example, the ophobia is at the end. But the rest, you've got to try to unscramble. And I'll give you points for every part of the word that you've got in the correct place. 
How many points? Is there like a multiplier? Uh, probably a thousand points a piece. <laughs> a piece, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> It'll be like a whose line rules. Yeah. <laughs> so your first one. This is a type of test used to examine parts of the esophagus, stomach, and small intestine. Gastro duodeno esophago scopy. Do I shout it out? If you've got one, yeah. Although maybe maybe we should make Kyle go first because his is less likely to be correct. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I could, but let it, let let Arna do it if he thinks he knows <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you uh, actually went on most of this journey where you went the esophagus, stomach, and then duodenum. So, Duod- there, yeah. so there we have our ordinary ordering. That is what I was going to guess. Esoph- yeah. Esophago, gastro, duodenoscopy. That was your answer as well, Kyle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, what you are said, both- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are both correct, and you both get, I guess, 3,000 points. <laughs> oh, Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is esophago gastro duodenoscopy. Esophago obviously comes from esophagus, from the Greek word oesophagos, meaning gullet or throat. Gastro from the Greek word gaster, meaning stomach. And duodeno, we got the etymology from just a moment ago. Perfect. <laughs> so is this is this when you're having your gi- digestive tract? completely removed what is this for again <laughs> well this is uh, this is they're looking at it so this is i oh, guess okay. when they send the camera down to look all the all way through exactly yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. gotcha yeah and the scopy we've actually mentioned this on the podcast before it comes from the greek oh, word right. scopos meaning to see or observe we looked at it with lichnoscope <laughs> in mm. science it usually refers to something that you look at things w- like an instrument that you look at things with but in medicine it refers to instruments that look at internal body parts usually Next one, this is the creation of a link or bridge between a hepatic duct and the gallbladder and between the gallbladder and the intestine to allow these organs to communicate. Huh? The parts, of the w- <laughs> parts of the word are entero, hepatico, colicist, cholangio, and stomies. Oh, stomies. I mean, I, I believe Arna gave us entero a minute ago as well. Yeah, I remember that. Kyle said very shakily. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is, ready? Hepatico entero. No, that'd be so weird. Yeah, I'll go for it. <laughs> Hepatico entero. Uh, wait, stomies is the end of it? Yes, yeah, stomies is it the end. It ends in stomies? <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> okay. Hepatico entero col- colangiocolosystomies. That's my guess. Okay. Arna? I'll go hepatico cholecyst choliangio enterostomies. Okay. Uh, Arna, you got two out of four. Kyle, you got one out of four. But Arna, your answer was the same one that I gave when we tested this game. So I feel good now. (laughs) 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 The the cholangio and cholecyst are swapped. That's what I was wondering about. Yeah. So it's hepatico cholangio cholecyst enterostomies. So hepatico comes from the Greek word hepar, meaning liver. Cholangio and cholesis, the first half of that is the same from the Greek word col, meaning bile. The angio part means vessel or duct, and the cyst part means bladder or sac. Entero, again, means intestine. And stomies comes from the Greek word stoma, meaning mouth or opening. And in this context, it refers to the creation of an opening or connection in the body. Mm-hmm. And that opening is so with stoma, you have the mouth connection there. I don't know if you've heard mouth with stoma. Oh, I have not, but I believe you. If you if you look at the underside of a leaf, there's the stomata that had the little tiny microscopic mouths with the guard cells oh, with little openings oh. that allow for breathing. That's why I remember a mouth with, with an opening for stoma. And oh, then yeah. with, with cholesis, a cyst refers to bladder. Um, and then coli is for bile, which I just referenced, because yeah. I think you mentioned that, but that was also appreciated with ancient Greece when they were looking at the duodenum and trying to understand what the function of that region of the small intestine was, that you have the gallbladder that's situated on the back of the liver, and there it stores bile, right? So it's a, that's kind of a crossover between our understanding of what it stores is, is bile, and then also linked back to the ancient Greek understanding of where they're considering the different types of humors. 
Oh, right. right. Yeah. And it's a small bile is one of the four. Yeah. And that's where that the gallbladder sitting on the back of the, the liver kind of accumulates the bile. And then when the time is right, particularly with kind of a lipid rich meal, which the bile is useful for breaking up, it squeezes and ejects the bile down into the duodenum and emulsifies the fats and breaks them apart. Wow. Okay. Next one. This is a drug that has antipyretic properties or antipyretic properties and is used to treat mild inflammations in cases such as rheumatism, neuritis, or the common cold. And the parts of the word are diphenylmethyl, methyl, di, amido, and pyrazolone or pyrazolone. Arna, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Pyrazolone? Pyrazolone? Sounds good. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, this is a rough one. This is a chemistry one. Kyle looks so forlorn. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle looks like I've just told him a relative is deathly ill. <laughs> I I mean, I guess I feel like if I don't sort this out, then somebody's not getting their medication. <laughs> I have a guess. Go for it. I know it can't be because I didn't move enough of the pieces around. Uh, listen, Seth could be all kinds of tricky. We don't know how moved around these are. Uh, my guess is methyl dimethyl diphenyl amido parazolone. Uh, I'm pretty so sure all wrong, those are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. It's going to affect Arna's answer. <laughs> so it's been a long time since I've taken organic chemistry and. <laughs> Uh, pharmacology is not my strong suit. So let's say dimethylphenylmethylamidopyrazolone. It is dimethylamidophenyldimethylpyrazolone. Ugh. But that's a tough one because it is truly all chemistry. And I won't even bother getting too into the etymologies. Di is a Greek prefix meaning two. And all the rest of them are basically compounds and, and molecules and stuff. <laughs> all right. One more. Okay. This is an extremely rare lung disease caused by the inhalation of ultrafine particles of silica dust originating from volcanoes. Kyle says he knows this, which would I astound me. This. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> the parts of the word are silico, micro, volcano, new mono, ultra, scopic, and coniosis. And according to Seth, this is the longest word in any English language dictionary. Okay. Wait, I want to make sure I've got all the parts. <laughs> Can I try oh, it? Yeah, go please. For it. Right, let's go with ultrascopic microsilico volcano pneumona coniosis. I think the only one that was technically in the right position, there was, there was one. Was it the last one? <laughs> <laughs> Not counting the last one. <laughs> no, you got one other. <laughs> This one's tough because the mistake I made, I had them all strung together right except for one. And so they all counted as wrong because they were all shifted over <laughs> out of place. Okay. I Go have a guess. Time. I don't know how right I am. My guess is no mono ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis. Kyle, 10 out of 10, <laughs> 7 Yay! out of 7. Perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I've heard this. I've seen this word before in like, uh, like spelling bee contexts. And I'm always like, this is a crazy word. Yes, exactly. Could you imagine nice if you got this one. in a spelling bee? <laughs> but I, I would quit. Like I would leave. <laughs> I, would, I would become a hermit. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah. once again, correct answer was <laughs> pneumono ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis. Pneumono comes from the Greek word for lung. Ultra is a Latin prefix meaning extremely. Micro is a Greek prefix meaning small. Scopic, again, comes from that Greek word scopos, meaning to see. Silico refers to the chemical element silicon, and by mm -hmm. extension, the mineral silica. Volcano, anybody know this one? It's a fun one. Where do we get the word volcano? No. Um, uh, is there a Greek god or a Roman god? There Vulcan? is. There is a Roman god, Vulcan. I'm trying to think of the Greek equivalent that we might recognize. Go on. The Greek equivalent is Hephaestus. He is the god of oh. fire and the forge and volcanoes. But they, 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 the god came before there was a word for volcanoes. Sure. <laughs> and then coniosis is from the Greek word conus, meaning dust. And in medical terminology, it refers to a lung disease caused by the inhalation of dust. And I think if I tally up the points, what an upset. 
<laughs> oh no! <laughs> I've got Kyle at eleven thousand and Arna at eight thousand. Oh no! <laughs> really, um, not the best way to to welcome our guest. <laughs> it feels it feels so wrong. I'm so sorry, Arna. It's it's an honor, Kyle. Well, listen. Unfortunately. Kyle won, but Arna, thank you so much for playing, and thank you so much for being here on our podcast. This was so, so wonderful. Well, that, that's all yeah. the more reason for me to come back, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. That's and, true. And hopefully with more Dungeons & Dragons-style <laughs> walkthroughs of, of anatomy. It was incredible. I think I've learned more about the human body today than I have in my entire life, so thank you for that. Sure. It's a, if there's a body system that totally lends itself to a journey, it's, it's the digestive system. It's going to be tough to do the same thing with another one, but <laughs> give it a shot or come at it from a different angle or something yeah. like that. Uh, but Arna, where can people find you in the meanwhile? What can people see of you? So on Instagram, the uh, the account is learnfirm underscore med underscore term. And that's primarily kind of where, where I post uh, med term and etymology type stuff. There's also a, a med term uh, subreddit. So it's, it's subreddit um, is med term. And a lot of the same material makes its way over there too. Yeah, so you can get your med term fix however you please. <laughs> uh, Arna, thank you so much again for joining us today. My pleasure. We, yeah, we absolutely love seeing your posts on Instagram. They're always surprisingly informative. And for all of those at home listening, we urge you Truly. to give it a follow, please. Yes. And for those folks who are listening, also remember that you can find Butter No Parsnips on social media as well on Facebook and on Instagram at Butter No Parsnips Podcast. And if you like today's episode, consider giving us a five star rating or review wherever you heard us. And if you really like today's episode, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash Butter No Parsnips. Donating $5 or more earns you a shout out either on social media or here on the podcast thanks so much to all of you you help us make what we make and with that i've been kyle imperator i've been emily moyers and i've been arna christensen and this has been butter no parsnips oh, nice. we didn't pick parsnips as the food to go to the <laughs> digestive system that was gonna be our suggestion butter and parsnips absolutely we <laughs> should have didn't we do that <laughs> Thank you for listening to Butter No Parsnips. Butter No Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and Kyle Imperator. The theme music and additional music is by Kyle Imperator. If you liked listening to this episode, subscribe and give us a good rating and or positive review wherever you heard it. If you really liked listening, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. There you can get bonus content you can't get anywhere else, like the monthly Patreon-exclusive podcast Buttered Parsnips. Your support means the world to us and encourages us to keep making more. Thanks in advance, and we'll be back next week.